Uh, just press the button. <laughs> okay, yeah. I would like to welcome you. Uh, first, I would like to uh, mention that uh, unfortunately, Professor Staudinger, the rector, cannot be here today, and therefore I will give the welcome address. And um, I am very pleased um, to, uh, to be able to do this. So, dear guest of honor, Professor Hassinger, dear members of the Theodresen community, dear guests, welcome to the Schönfeld Auditorium and welcome to everybody who is online to today's inaugural lecture, the first one in summer 2023. With this lecture, we also kick off the second year of our university-wide inaugural lectures. With these, we started as a tra tradition last year and have already welcomed seven professors of outstanding importance to our university, researchers who pursue innovative interdisciplinary approaches to the major challenges of the 21st century. Today's lecture is now the second in this framework in which we present a faculty member of physics. It was at our first inaugural lecture in January 2022 that we welcomed Alexei Chernikov, a professor from City Cumat, and today we do so again with Elena Hassinger. Main pillars of research of the Faculty of Physics are two. First, quantum materials, broadly understood, ranging from organic solar cells to novel quantum states of matter, mainly anchored in the research priority area, material science and engineering. City Cumat is strong part of this and Elena Hassinger fits in this very well. Second is broad field of physics of high energies. Here we go all the way from the cosmos and astrophysics to high-tech science with great innovative power. You all know it. We have succeeded in acquiring the German Center for Astrophysics at the, as a national large-scale research center for Lusatia an internationally visible beacon in the region from a joint initiative of German astronomy and astroparticle physics. This project shows the importance of universal concepts and breadth of physics. In this specialized field of physics, experts in advanced transport experiment, experiments are needed, and it needs outstanding researchers who can shape the future research. Today, we welcome a researcher who fits both bills, Elena Hassinger. She is very strong in the desired field of transport, and she does breakthrough research in superconductivity. Elena Hassinger is an, has an, is an important gain for us, for our future, and for the research of her field at TU Dresden as a leading research location for material science. Which states of matter exist, and how can we control them? This is the crucial question that Elena Hassinger is working on. She observes and investigates quantum materials that have a great potential for future applications for superconductivity. Transporting electricity and quantum computi computing are the main application fields to which she devotes her research. A scientist with an ambition to shape our future. For example, when it comes to loss-free power transmission, a crucial question with regard to our sustainable power generation, which in part um, takes place far away from consumption and is gaining completely new relevance with the ongoing energy transition. Or let's think of the mag magnetic resonance tomographs in our hospitals. For example, her research could lead to much higher resolution images in the future. In her talk, she will tell us more about her research in the vibrant field of condensed matter research on quantum materials. I can only briefly give the hint, cerium rhodium arsenic is the material that Elena Hassinger hopes will be the seminal hint in the search for the hot superconductors. But first, let me briefly tell you something about Elena Hassinger's scientific career. As physicist, she studied at the University of Heidelberg before earning her doctorate in Grenoble. Her path then took her to Canada and her postdoc at Sherbrooke University. Since 2014, she has been back in Germany and came to Dresden as a research group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Physics of Solids. In parallel, she had a, held a tenure-track professorship at TU Munich from 2016. And in 2021, 
she was appointed at TU Dresden at IFMP as professor for low temperature physics of complex electron systems, which belongs to the excellence cluster CTQMAT. We will hear more in detail about her person and her research in a moment. I am very pleased that we succeeded to attract to our institution Professor Elena Hassinger. A warm welcome to Tio Dresden. Elena Hassing Hassinger has already been visible active, visibly active for many years. She symbolizes our Dresden concept science and innovation campus in terms of professional excellence, but also in terms of various activities for equal opportunities in science and for implicit bias awareness. At this point, I'm very pleased to also welcome Professor Carsten Tim, the Dean of the Faculty of Physics, Professor Andrew McKenzie, the Director of the P Department Physics of Quantum Materials at the MPI for Cl uh, Chemical Physics of Solids, and Professor Matthias Voita, the spokesperson of the Excellence Cluster CTQMAT. They will introduce you to the person, Elena Hassinger, her chair, her work at Max Planck, and at CTQMAT. But before, however, I would like to thank all the organizers who made this festive inaugural lecture possible. Our chief of protocol, Christine Milkau. She's not here? Anyway. The colleagues of the Excellence Cluster CTQMAT, namely Dr. Alina Markova, she is there, over there. The colleagues at the Faculty of Physics and at the Max Planck Institute, I'm quite sure that many of them are here in the room, and as well as the colleagues from our communication office and all the people in our technical area above. As usual, the lecture and question and answer will be followed by a reception in the lobby downstairs, and you're all cordially invited. Now let me turn over the mic to Professor Carsten Tim, who will give the next speech. Thank you very much. <clears throat> dear Vice Rector Rüsen Wolf, dear Elena, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> as uh, the Vice Rector said, um, it's not the first time I, I stand here to represent the Faculty of Physics, and of course I'm um, proud and happy to do, to do that now for the second time. It's gratif grat gratifying to, to see that um, we are the first faculty that is so honored by the presentation of a outstanding new faculty member um, for the first, who is the first to be here for the second time, so that's the correct um, uh, wording. Um, before I come to Elena Hassinger and her role in the strategy of our faculty, I would like to make a general remark. I have made it a rule to attend all of these uh, university-wide inaugural lectures. I may actually be the only one now that the rector cannot be here today. <laughs> And uh, so I, I feel that I have some um, justification to say that uh, I find that this is an excellent format to um, introduce the TOD community to outstanding new faculty members. Um, and I'm happy that so many of you are here today and I, I wish we could take this even more into the breadth of the university in the future. <clears throat> About um, Elena Hassinger, yes, indeed, um, she fits very well into the strategy of our faculty, and um, uh, Vice Rector Rosenwolf has uh, actually um, already given about half of the remarks I, I would have, have made, otherwise no problem. <laughs> And also introdu already introduced uh, what, the, what the main uh, pillars, the big pillars of our faculty are. Let me just um, shortly summarize. The one is the material science, and um, uh, yes, this ranges from applied physics in OLEDs and organic solar cells to fundamental, fundamental questions of uh, novel quantum states of matter. Um, I always like to point out that uh, this applied research on OLEDs and, and solar cells is somehow no less quantum mechanical than, uh, than the fundamental stuff. So um, solar cells and OLEDs only work due to, to quantum effects. So all of this is quantum materials physics. Um, and of course, yes, Elena Hassinger is uh, a part, an important partner of, of this, this track. And the other, the other pillar is uh, 
physics at high energies and in the cosmos, which is indeed strengthened or about to be strengthened by the German Center for Astrophysics. I would also like to say that, that physics by its self-image self is um, concerned with what is universal, not so much with what is, or not only with what is specific. So for that reason, um, our faculty is not limited to those, those two pillars. They are just the largest ones. So there are many more efforts, uh, many more research is going on that is not less uh, excellent, but simply not uh, represented by multiple professorships. <clears throat> so returning to Elena Hassinger, um, the, the story started when the, the Faculty of Physics and uh, the cluster of excellence city QMOD identified the need for an expert in uh, advanced ex, uh, ex transport experiments, as the vice rector said, in magnetic systems and semi-metals. We had unfortunately lost a uh, colleague in this field to another university. Um, we did a rather broad search. Uh, I should say that I'm much in favor to uh, of broad searches, not very specific ones, because after all, we are not we are looking for someone who will do outstanding research, not just next year, but in the next 30 plus years, uh, and also not only go with what is uh, with the flow of what what are hot topics, but basically define what hot top, what hot topics are. Um, and I think uh, Elena Hassinger um, is a good example for this because um, we not only did, is she of course an expert on the field we wanted to strengthen in transport experiments, but uh, again, uh, Vice Rector Rosenwolf already mentioned this, he ha she has also recently made outstanding contributions to a different field, namely superconductivity. And in that, this will certainly be also important for the future, future development of our faculty and define, for example, what the next collaborative research center after the present one Will, will be. So um, we have not only found a um, leading expert in the field, but in fact a person who can play a leading role in shaping the future of our faculty. Um, finally, I would like to point out that um, the reason that Andrew McKenzie from Max Planck Institute, uh, Institute for Chemical Physics, Physics of Solids is here is um, that um, this institute was extremely supportive and helpful in creating a offer, a package for uh, Elena Hassinger that, uh, that allowed us to make a competitive offer, which is important to get excellent people, obviously. And this, I think, is a prime example of the spirit of Dresden concept. So with this, I would like to welcome you again to our faculty, Elena, and um, hand over to Andy McKenzie, please. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, you uh, colleagues in the university are just starting to get to know Eleanor, but she's been a valued member of our institute for nearly 10 years now, it's, uh, it's surprisingly. Uh, and you were probably the first major recruit that came that I had something to do with. I remember being uh, uh, put in touch with you by Louis Taifer in Canada, and we started talking about you applying for one of our independent fellowships, and it's all worked extremely well since then. I wanted to make a couple of other cooperative remarks, though, because uh, part of the backstory to uh, this particular, the way this recruitment happened, is that uh, I was the managing director of our institute at the time when Professor Stouding arrived in Dresden, and she was holding a series of uh, uh, then Zoom meetings with all the institute heads. And right at the end of mine, we had a long-ranging discussion, and right at the end of mine, I made the casual remark that we had uh, a really excellent person in our institute who was about to get tenured at TU Munich and be kind of snapped up and taken away from the Dresden community. And uh, I was very impressed with the speed with which she then got in touch with the, the physics faculty and said, you know, uh, if it were possible to do something and if this were the right person, uh, in general terms, this would have my support. And I think uh, as we were sitting down together with Matthias and Carsten and the colleagues in physics to come up with the package that uh, Carsten mentioned, I think it's, it's very important to know that you have 
this kind of in principle backing from the top. I think that really oils everything and it was very helpful indeed. And uh, I have to say, I'm just delighted that it's worked out. Uh, as time goes forward, Eleanor now has an official position of something called Max Planck Fellow in our, our institute, which means that she receives funding from Max Planck Central uh, for at least the next five years with the possibility of renewal for another five. That's allowing her to have some very uh, sophisticated experimental equipment that she set up during her time with us. She will continue with that in our institute. It would be very difficult actually to move it. And she'll be running a, a small group in our institute as well as the group that she has at the university. And yeah, this is a, a superb example of the way that we can collaborate for maximum benefit for uh, science and physics in Dresden. So we're, from our institute, very, very pleased to see that it's happened. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thanks to the previous um, speakers for all the introductions, so I can be very brief here. Um, my task is to, um, again, say a few words about Elena Hassinger herself and her career. As has already been mentioned, she started her physics education in Heidelberg, um, got a diploma there in 2007, and then for a postdoc moved to France to the group of um, Jacques Floquet. Um, for the experts, not surprisingly, she worked on heavy fermion physics. Um, and she got a PhD um, in Grenoble in 2010 and then decided to move to Canada, um, to Sherbrooke, um, to work with Louis Taifer. And that was the place where she got in broader contact with superconductors. I mean, there have been superconductors in Grenoble as well. But um, I should mention in Grenoble there were a lot of, she produced a string of interesting works on uranium, ruthenium to silicon too, which is a material famous or infamous for a phenomenon called hidden order. Which I guess is still not fully understood. Um, so um, Elena stayed in Canada for about four years and then she won the competition for this independent Max Planck research group which has been mentioned a number of times. So she has been at MPI CPFS since 2014 and connected to this she became a tenure track professor at TU Munich in 2016. So as has been mentioned Elena has been working well broadly on strongly correlated electron systems um, starting with heavy fermions, then uh, on various types of superconductors. She's an expert both in thermodynamic measurement and also in various types of transport measurements. Um, she has done a lot of interesting work on topological metals, mapping out Fermi surfaces using quantum oscillation uh, experiments. Um, she has worked on superconductors, and that is the topic she will tell us about today, in particular her discovery on uh, the superconducting phase in cerium, rhodium to arsenic to um, has sparked a worldwide interest in this material. And she has also been uh, very active in developing experimental techniques for measurements, in particular thermal conductivity, under extreme conditions. So she is setting up right now, or she has set up, um, uh, the equipment for uh, thermal conductivity measurements at ultra low temperatures. And that is something which will be particularly important for the research which we will be performing in the future, both in uh, the Collaborative Research Center 1143, where um, since January she is now one of the PIs, and also within the Excellence Cluster City QMAT. So with this, I guess I can hand over finally to Elena and uh, to Superconductivity. to see so many of you here and also hello to all the people watching online. Welcome to this talk. It's a great honor for me to hold this university-wide inaugural lecture and I would like to thank the rector, Professor Staudinger, for giving me this opportunity. Also, I would like to thank the previous speakers for the kind introduction and especially Andy for the support that he gave me during all these years that I'm in Dresden already. Also, I'd like to thank all the people that are making this event happen. I'm very happy to be a professor at TU Dresden now. 
already during the past nine years. I really appreciated the great environment Dresden offers for solid state physics. I was able to collaborate with some of the world leading experts in the fields that work here. I was able to use the excellent infrastructure at the Max Planck Institute, but also at other institutes, for example, the Magnetic High Field Lab in Dresden. Okay, today I'm going to present my field of research and especially, as you've heard, I don't only work on superconductivity, but superconductivity will be the subject of the talk today because of this nice discovery that we've had in our group and in our institute. But before I start, I would like to acknowledge the contributions of my collaborators. I'm working with sample growers, theorists, and other experimentalists in many different places all over the, the world, and it's very inspiring to discuss and work with them. And especially, I would like to thank the members of my group, many of who are here today, but also previous members of the group. These are the people who have built up the lab, developed experiments, um, improved the resolution, they take beautiful data, analyze the data, write papers. It's a great pleasure to work with them and also to see them grow as a scientist. So materials are really important and they have always shaped our societies. The way we lived and still live today is determined by the materials that we are able to handle. And that's also the reason why all these different eras of humans were named after the materials that were at hand. So Stone Age, Copper Age, and so on. Since the discovery of the transistor in 1947, we're in the so-called Silicon Age. But solid state researchers of today are already working on the materials of the future. But to understand what these are, uh, we have to know where we start from. So today, almost all the technology is based on three different types of material classes. And they are shown in the little pictures above the smartphone. And these are metals, insulators, and semiconductors. And combining these in very complex ways, you can basically build up a smartphone and make artificial intelligence. So we understand these properties very well. And to go a step further in our research, we basically need two ingredients. One ingredient is complexity. And one way to increase the complexity and get new properties of matter is to study more complex material structures. So we start, for example, from uh, copper. Here is shown the structure of copper. But this is just a unit cell. So if you want to get to your piece of copper in your hand, you have to repeat the unit cells uh, tens of millions of times in each direction periodically, and this will make the copper crystal. Now, copper has only one uh, element as ingredient, but we are studying materials with m three or four different constituent elements, and the structures can be very complicated. These are just two examples that I show here. Another ingredient is to have materials where the interactions between electrons are strong. So the number of atoms in our materials is of the order of 10 to the 23, and so is the number of electrons. And the electrons are actually the particles that determine the properties in the end. So if it's a metal or an insulator, and so on. And so here I just plot a very small number of electrons, and I plot them as red little dots. But in um, our field, we have to write down the equations with waves because these are quantum particles. Now, when we add interactions here between the electrons, this means that every electron interacts, has a f there's a force acting between all the other electrons. And you can um, understand that 
because there are so many electrons, this is a very complicated problem. Each of these lines here would be one term in your formula that you have to solve. But we know from experiments that strongly interacting electron systems um, lead to, or that they have new quantum many body states. And superconductivity is one example of such a state. And these new states, they can lead to new functionalities and new applications. And the materials where this occurs, we call it quantum matter or quantum materials. So what is important to keep in mind is that the collective behavior of all our electrons is not at all the same as the behavior of a single electron. And you will see that later also in the example of superconductivity. So from now on, I will focus on superconductivity. So this effect, superconductivity, was discovered in the beginning of the last century by a man called Heike Kammerling Onnes. And he was the first man who was able to uh, liquefy helium and reach temperatures below 4 Kelvin. So just for those who don't know, we are now at 300 Kelvin here at room temperature, roughly. And zero Kelvin is minus 243 degrees Celsius. So he, um, that was in 1908, and then he measured the property of uh, metals, the resistance of metals, when he lowers the temperature. And what they observed, what he observed, was that the resistance decreases, and the reason is that electrons, who are responsible for transport, they uh, scatter with lattice vibrations in your metal. And these lattice vibrations, they decrease with temperature, and that makes electronic flow easier, and the resistivity goes down. So he measured a, a, a metal, mercury, that he could make in really high purity. And um, he observed that the resistivity uh, drops, as shown in a normal metal. But then suddenly, at low temperature, uh, at 4.2 Kelvin, it drops to zero. And normally at low temperatures, you can see here that the resistance stays constant, and that's be because the electrons scatter with impurities in the material. But despite the presence of impurities in mercury, this resistance really drops to absolute zero. And the transition temperature where this happens is called critical temperature, uh, in a, and this is the superconducting state. So it was verified later that the resistance is really absolutely zero, but you can, for example, put a current in a ring-shaped superconductor below the critical temperature, and this current will just flow forever. So these are really perfect um, conductors, despite the fact that there are impurities. And Kamaling Onnes got the Nobel Prize for this. A second amazing property of superconductors is their behavior in a magnetic field. So what you see on the left is a superconductor. This is the superconductor. It's cooled by liquid nitrogen, which is basically liquid air. Uh, it's at 77 degrees. That's enough to make this material a superconductor. And I have uh, one of these pills here, so you can touch it. And then above, there is a magnet, and this magnet just levitates. So it, it doesn't touch the superconductor, it levitates. And this happens because, so normally, the magnetic field produced by this magnet is uh, shown here on the right by these uh, arrows. It could just penetrate a normal material. But then when we cool down the system and the, the, the sample and it becomes a superconductor, this will just lead to the fact that the magnetic field is expelled from the superconductor and the field inside is zero. And that's the reason why this magnet floats above the superconductor, because the superconductor does not allow a penetration of the field of the magnet. But it doesn't just float here, 
but if you push a little bit, it will uh, go back into the same position. And the reason for this is that actually when you increase the magnetic field and the field of this magnet is large enough to be in this state here, then the magnetic field is allowed to penetrate, but only in quantized flux lines. And these are called vortices. And these vortices are pinned at impurities. And then the magnetic field configuration between magnet and superconductor is basically fixed. And then the rest, uh, relative position of the magnet and the superconductor is fixed. So what you can even take the magnet here and lift it up, and this you will lift up the superconductor with it. So I have this experiment with me, and after the talk, if you're interested at the reception, you can uh, try it out yourself. Okay, when you increase the field even further, then the superconducting state will be destroyed, and you come back to the normal state where the magnetic field can just penetrate your material. And Aprikosov, he gained the Nobel Prize for theoretical work on vortices. Okay, now how do we understand these properties? And that's the slide on the theory of superconductivity. So what happens in a superconductor is that the electrons form pairs, and these are called Cooper pairs. Um, and you can imagine that a Cooper pair is two electrons which uh, go in circles one around the other. Now, the question is, why do electrons form pairs? They should repel each other strongly because they are both negatively charged. And the argument that Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer, who developed this theory, developed, uh, uh, yes, is that as one electron travels through the lattice, which consists of positively charged ions, it will attract the ions towards each other. So you will have a net positive charge density here, and this positive charge density will then attract the second electron. And that will create, via the lattice, an attractive interaction between the electrons. Okay, so there were three Nobel Prizes in total on theory of superconductivity, as shown here on the bottom. But what is special is that these Cooper pairs are not independent from each other. Um, they rather form a quantum state of matter, which is macroscopic, and it extends over the whole sample. So it can be described by a macroscopic wave function that has really the size of the sample here. So you can imagine it in the following way. If this room is our sample and we are all the electrons, then in the normal state we would walk around independently, but when our sample becomes superconducting, then we would pair up and start dancing, but every couple dances exactly like all the other couples. So it's a big choreography. Okay. Now, based on the properties you have seen of these superconductors, um, you can imagine different types of applications, and there are already applications. And that was mentioned before. But one example is that you can transport current without losses, and uh, you can transport much more current in a superconducting cable than in a normal cable. And this will be used in a Paris Montparnasse station to transport electricity to the trains. And they will use cables that look like the one shown here. But the levitating aspect, you can also use it for transportation. And in Dresden at the IFW, they have built this prototype of a car that levitates over a rail of magnets. And um, of course, what you gain here is that there is no friction because you have no wheels. There's only friction with air. And there are also prototypes of trains that work like this. And one application that was also mentioned is the MRIs. And the superconductor is actually a coil here that, is, uh, that creates the magnetic field you need to, to make these images. 
But in all these applications, still cooling is needed because all the superconductors we know, they get only superconducting at low temperatures. So one big goal in the research on superconductivity is to find a room temperature superconductor. And I want to uh, show you a little bit where we are in this re regarding this goal. So here's a graph where on the x-axis you have the year of a discovery of superconductivity in a certain material. And on the y-axis you have the according TC. And they only put points where the TC is a record value. So it starts with mercury at 4.2 Kelvin in 1911, as you know, and then materials with higher TC were found. But the big, big, big breakthrough was in 1986, when um, Bednotz and Müller found uh, materials that suddenly conduct, uh, were superconducting at much higher temperature. And these are cuprate-based materials and uh, on the red, the, the red line here. Then in 2000, uh, oh sorry. In 2007, eight, a new family was discovered based on iron and they also reached high temperatures but not as high as the cuprates, that's the violet line. And then in 2015 came a big step to higher temperatures where superconductivity was found in hydrogen-based materials. And these um, actually, this only occurs in extremely high pressures. Okay, so the pressures you see here where this material and this becomes superconducting is actually two million times atmospheric pressure or roughly half the pressure in the core of the Earth. So this is not good for applications. But maybe you've heard it in the media, there are also two reports now already on room temperature superconductivity, and these are both from the same group and also based on hydrogen-rich compounds. One is carbon, uh, a mixture of carbon, hydrogen, and sulfur, and the other one nitrogen, hydrogen, and sulfur. And what is amazing is that in this material, um, the pressure you need to get superconductivity is actually pretty low. One gigapascal is something we can easily reach in the lab. However, these discoveries are strongly debated at the moment. One of these publications has been retracted, and um, the problem is that so far no other group was able to reproduce these results. So we are waiting for a confirmation of these discoveries. Okay. There are two types of superconductors in, in the ones that are on this graph. One are called the conventional superconductors. And they are conventional because the theory that I have explained to you can describe these systems pretty well. And uh, both the green and the hydrate-based superconductors are, are uh, conventional superconductors. However, the high TC superconductors that are used in wires, for example, now are unconventional superconductors. In these systems, the electrons also form Cooper pairs but the mechanism by which this happens is not understood. So this means that the attractive force that is causing the formation of Cooper pairs is not well understood yet. Okay, so it, to reach the first goal of superconductivity at room temperature, the unconventional superconductors are still the best candidates, and it's very important that we understand unconventional superconductivity better. But there's also a second big goal, and this is to find so-called odd parity superconductivity, and that's why my discovery comes into play. So odd parity superconductors can sustain much higher magnetic field, and for example, they could be used for energy storage to when you make magnets that can survive up to high fields, but, and they are also needed for topological quantum computing. 
And this type of superconductivity, odd parity superconductivity, is also a type of unconventional superconductivity. So this odd parity, what does it mean? It's actually a quite simple symmetry um, property, and it's depicted on the right. So if you have an inversion symmetric system, as for example these two triangles, and you start from an inversion center, you go in one direction and then by the same length in the other direction, you will find this uh, a positive value on both sides, then it's called even parity. But if your sign changes between one side and the other side, then it's called odd parity. And for the wave function of our superconductor for this macroscopic quantum state, this means that um, this type of function, which is positive everywhere, would be even parity, and this type of function where the sign changes would be odd parity. Okay, and the best candidates for odd parity superconductors are actually the so-called heavy fermion superconductors that were also mentioned before, and they don't appear on this graph because they have pretty low critical temperatures. But they are um, studied as model systems to understand unconventional superconductivity, and as I mentioned, they are the best candidates for odd parity superconductivity. And so how do we recognize an odd parity superconductor when we see a superconductor? And the way to recognize it is to look at the behavior in magnetic field. And what I show here is the critical field phase diagram of a normal superconductor. This would be lead. It's one of those that have been discovered in the very beginning. So what we do is we measure, for example, resistivity as a function of temperature, and we see that the resistivity drops to zero, and we do this in zero field. And then we put a point here at 7 Kelvin, and then we apply a magnetic field, and we do our measurement again, and we get a lower TC, and we can put another point, and so on, until we uh, create this curve. And this curve is actually a separation between the superconducting state and the normal state, where it's just a metal. And just to give you a feeling of the fields that you need in lead, this is uh, of the order 0.05 tes uh, Tesla, yes. And this is roughly 100 times the Earth magnetic field, but it's much lower than the field you would have in a magnet you can buy, which is of the order of one Tesla. Okay, what I want you to keep in mind here is that if you normalize the critical field uh, by Tc, then you will have a very low uh, value of 0.01 temp uh, so Tesla over Kelvin. If we compare now even and odd parity superconductivity here, you can see that these curves look very different in the two cases. For an even parity superconductor, the critical field curve is very small. Uh, so the fields to destroy superconductivity are small. For the odd parity superconductor, you need a much higher field to destroy the critical field. And the reason is the following. There is a mechanism that breaks a Cooper pair and destroys superconductivity, which is called Pauli pair breaking. And the it works like this. These are the electrons of the Cooper pair, and they have opposite velocity, but they also have opposite spin. So electron has a spin, so you can imagine it as like a little magnet, and the poles of the magnet in the, Cooper, uh, in the electrons of the Cooper pair point in opposite directions. That's shown here on the left. Okay, my pointer is not working. Um, and the reason why they point in opposite directions is uh, because of symmetry constraints in the even parity case. And when you apply a magnetic field now, like the needle of your compass, it wants to align with the field, and so it will flip one of the spins, and then the Cooper pair is broken and the superconducting state is broken. 
for the odd parity state, uh, the situation is different because the spins of the electrons in a Cooper pair point in the same direction. So when you apply a magnetic field in that case, it can orient the whole Cooper pair, but it cannot break the Cooper pair. And that's why the critical field is large and the superconducting state survives up to much larger fields. Okay, another way to recognize odd parity superconductivity is to observe multiple superconducting states. Because of the spin degrees of freedom, so different options for sp spins in the Cooper pair, you can have different states in a magnetic field and there are only two materials which show multiple superconducting states and these are the two uranium compounds that you see here. And in these compounds, it's thermodynamically confirmed that you really have several phases. However, theoretically, it's not well understood what exactly these phases are, and there's still uh, research and debate going on. Okay, and we have now discovered another candidate for odd parity superconductivity, and of course, it all starts with a sample. So this sample was grown by my colleague at the Max Planck Institute, CPFS, Seung Yoon Kim. He did the basic characterization, but actually he also discovered the superconducting state in this material and some of the field properties already. And the tip, this is a typical sample we have in our lab. So uh, it's about one millimeter size, and you can see the facets. So it's a nice crystal. And in my lab, then, we are able to do high sensitivity bulk measurements of transport and magnetic probes in extreme conditions. So here you see the refrigerator we use to cool down the sample to 20 millikelvin. This is 20 thousandths of Kelvin above absolute zero. And the sample will sit here. And we put this inside this container, which is a dewer on the left, in which a superconducting magnet can create a magnetic field of 17 Tesla. Okay. And doing this, we can address the following questions. So how well can the material conduct electricity? How does the material react to a magnetic field? And with other colleagues at the Max Planck Institute, we can also look at uh, size changes of the sample as we cool down, and also how does its capacity to store energy change. And the typical curve is, uh, or the measurement data look like the, uh, shown in the graph in the bottom here. So what is shown here is the AC susceptibility as a function of temperature. And for example, the black curve will be in zero magnetic field. You can see that the susceptibility is approximately constant. And then it drops when the material becomes superconducting at roughly 0 0.3 uh, Kelvin. And then we again apply the field and we do this measurement again. These are the different colored curves. And using this, we can plot the critical field phase diagrams that we uh, discovered in this material, cerium rhodium to arsenic 2. And they are shown here on the left, and they are really highly unusual. So why is it unusual? Well, if you look at the lower graph, um, it looks rather normal, like in lead. But if you look at the values of the critical field, which is 2 Tesla, it is much, much larger than the, than the critical temperature. So if you divide this, you will find a value of 8, which was 0.01 for lead. And for other superconductors, uh, this value will be typically always below um, 2. And this is actually even stronger for fields applied. So here, actually, the field was applied in the plane of the tetragonal crystal. So this is the model of the crystal, and it would be in this direction. But in the top graph, the uh, field is applied along the c-axis, like this. 
And then we have a critical field that is even higher and it's 15 and this value of normalized critical field is actually one of the highest that is observed in any material. What is also special then, of course, is the fact that we have two superconducting phases and we have this strange kink uh, in the phase diagram. So how can we understand this? Well, the amazing thing in this material is then we, that we can understand it pretty well based on the crystal structure. And so this crystal structure is shown here on the left and it has uh, certain symmetry properties that I would like to show you. This structure is inversion symmetric. So again, we have this inversion center and we go in one direction or in the other, we will always find the same atom and we can go from green to green or gray to gray. It doesn't matter. And these colors, of course, are cerium, rhodium and arsenic. However, the properties of the material, so the electronic properties, are dominated by cerium electrons. When we go to the cerium position and we put the inversion center at the cerium place, you can see that it's not inversion symmetric. You go in one direction, you find a rhodium atom. In the other direction, you find arsenic. And this is what we call locally non-centrosymmetric. And to make this a little bit clearer, I have now a 2D model of this crystal structure, which looks a bit simpler. So here we also have three types of atoms. We have the... Uh, we have the cerium where it's shown, but the cerium is also here and here. So there are layers of cerium and the other types of atoms are arranged in the way that you get these little triangles and the orientation of the triangles changes between the layers. And these triangles actually represent something we call spin orbit coupling uh, in, in, yeah, in our field. And so in this type of, yeah, just to show you again, it has the same properties, our artificial 2D crystal. At the cerium, we ha it's not inversion symmetric, but if we put the inversion center between the triangles, then it is inversion symmetric. So in this type of crystal structure, the superconducting state has actually two options. It can have an even parity state where the sign is the same on these layers, and it can have an odd parity superconducting state where the sign is opposite on these layers. And now if we want to know what the critical field looks like in um, such a system, we somehow have to combine the critical fields of even and odd parity superconductors. And what we will end up is a phase diagram like this. And this was actually theoretically predicted it already in 2012, and the theory was written for a layered system of superconductors separated by layers of a normal conductor. But in this system for which the theory was made, they never discovered this type of phase diagram. But what the prediction is that if you start with an even parity superconductor in zero magnetic field, and you apply the field, then this state will be destroyed, um, and then suddenly your system switches to an odd parity superconducting state. And this is actually exactly the phase diagram we observe for fields along the C-axis in this bulk material. And it's the first time this type of phase diagram was observed and also such a parity transition. And it also shows us that the superconducting state at high fields, the SC2, is actually an odd parity state. Okay, so that was our discovery. And uh, since this discovery, we have been working on this material because it's also interesting for other aspects. And I just want to flash very quickly some of the works that we have done in our group in collaboration with other groups at my institute, but also at other places. So we have actually, sorry, let me go back. We have looked at the angle dependence of the superconducting critical fields 
which confirm this idea of a switch from even to odd parity superconductivity. We have also looked at the normal state, and in the normal state, there's another ordered phase, which is maybe a quadrupole density wave order. And we have investigated the behavior of this phase in magnetic fields in the plane. Um, and the relation between this phase and the superconducting state is actually something that we need to uh, work out and understand better. Then NMR measurements of a collaborating group in Japan, they have observed a broadening of their line, which indicates antiferromagnetic order in this material, additionally to superconducting and quadruple density wave orders. Then we have determined the thermal conductivity of this material, uh, because thermal conductivity is a very powerful probe to determine the superconducting state and its properties. However, we found that crystal quality is still an issue in this material, at least for thermal conductivity. Um, and then we were interested, what is the effect of the structure? And we looked at a different material where we replaced the cerium by lanthanum, but the structure stays the same. And in principle, this two-phase superconductivity uh, would also be possible. However, what we find is that in this system, the critical fields are extremely low. You can see here they are of the order of millitesla and not tesla. And last but not least, we've also studied the phase diagram with the normal state order for fields along the c-axis. So we are working on this interesting compound, but the idea is to understand why, what are the conditions that we need to s observe odd parity superconductivity more generally and the two superconducting phases. So in the future, we also want to apply hydrostatic and uniaxial pressure and we can address some open questions. Now, this is also more for the experts. Um, which parameters stabilize the two-phase superconductivity? What is the pairing mechanism? And is the system close to a quantum critical point? And this will allow us to find control parameters, test our understanding, and then to control these states. And to show you that this actually has a wider implication, um, since our discovery, it has been realized that the structural pattern of local non-central symmetry is actually present in a number of other unconventional superconductors. And the effects the structure has on the superconducting state is not understood in these materials. And especially the two materials that show multiple superconducting phases they also have this property. They are shown here uh, on the top left. Okay, with that, I would like to conclude and thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. So thank you very much, Elena. <coughs> so the talk is open for discussion. Yes, Man Manfred. Um. <coughs> thank you for this very nice, uh, instructive talk for a non-superconductor specialist. But I have a question. You, you, you stress the, uh, the even and odd parity, uh, which I guess is S and P wave, but uh, there is also D wave, and I think the high PCs are D wave, and they have the even higher critical field. Isn't that right? Um, the critical field itself is higher, but if you compare critical field with respect to the TC, then it's uh, lower. Um, but the D wave superconductors are also even parity superconductors. But the the specialty in this system is that we can have S-like pairing or P-like pairing within the layers, but this doesn't matter. You can, with both, you can have even and odd parity states, 
depending on how you arrange them between the layers. So even for odd parity pairing, you could imagine an even parity state. Thank you. Other questions? Maybe um, I can ask a stupid question. These are, uh, in, in your material, there are um, three, let's say, very um, special elements that have been combined. And um, is there a possibility to simulate the, the uh, uh, arrangement of such materials that you can maybe uh, combine other elements within these um, crystals and um, uh, just try uh, other uh, combinations? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, when you have the crystal and you know the crystal structure, so you know how these uh, different elements are arranged, you cannot predict what the low temperature properties are. Our theory uh, specialists are not yet able, so no one knew that this was hap would happen in this material. And in the same way, we can't predict if we just replace some atoms by something else, what will happen. But of course, experimentally, we are trying this out. So we are already studying materials of the same family, so same structure, but for example, replacing rhodium by iridium. And uh, we are looking if we can find similar things. And then more broadly, what I tried to say in the end was that the structural motive also happens in other structures, so with this local non-central symmetry, and then we can go to uh, even much broader classes of superconductors. But experiments are needed. Thank you. Is low temperature specific heat indicative of the nodes in these superconducting phases, <laughs> or is it too difficult to, to access that? Uh, so Manuel Brando and his group, they have measured specific heat in this system. And what we observe at the moment is that the low temperature behavior depends strongly on sample quality. And we think that we are not yet in the limit where we see the intrinsic behavior. But it seems that as this uh, value of residual um, resistive, the gamma term decreases with um, with uh, better and better crystal quality, um, it, mi it might look like an S-wave, uh, the full gap superconductor. There are also other measurements that indicate this, like penetration depth from USR, but that's all the information we have at the moment. Thank you. <coughs> other questions? I have a specific question, so you made me cur now more curious about the system. So you said there is a quadrupolar density wave, and I wanted to ask uh, what is the evidence for this? So what has been done to observe uh, this kind of ordering? So we have no microscopic evidence for this state. What we have is that the resistivity increases at the transition temperature, which is similar to other density wave states. We know that the magnetic response is absent, as uh, like, like with the resolution we can uh, determine. However, we clearly see s um, signatures in the thermal expansion. And then also from theory, we can, or from experiment, we can extract the crystal electric field states in this material. And they show that we have two doublets which are rather close in energy. They're only 30 Kelvin apart. And this is of the order of the condo temperature in this material. And so you can imagine that the condo effect leads to a mixing of these two doublets to form a quasi-quartet. And then um, the itinerant electrons in the material 
can acquire quadrupolar degrees of freedom and, and can uh, order. And also another indication from theory is that uh, the calculated Fermi surface by Gertrud Zwicknagel um, shows that there are parallel paths, so you can have nesting. And, and then what is the relation to the superconductivity? Uh? Well, this is uh, completely unknown. First, um, so when you apply the field along the C-axis, this, uh, this other order, maybe quadruple density wave, was suppressed, and one possibility was that it is actually the suppression of the state is actually responsible for the change of the superconducting state. But this we have ruled out in uh, Konstantin Semenyuk's paper recently with the phase diagram where we show that the, the state is actually suppressed at much higher fields. Yeah. And it indicates the interaction is weak. Thank you. Do you have hope that in this material class you can find higher TC values? No. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Other questions? Patrick? So I have one small comment regarding your uh, the uh, second or third slide that um, the Kamerling once got the Nobel Prize not discovering the superconductivity, but in general working on his, his work on low temperature. This is the first comment. And my question or the query is that, uh, is there any uh, night shift measurements of your um, system, NMR night shift? Because yes. that can yeah, tell something about the, um, how these things. Um, okay, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't mention this before. There are night shift measurements that um, that show that there is a decrease of the night shift in the superconducting state, and this also indicates, uh, yeah, S wave pairing. First of all, we will um, welcome you again and uh, take a photo, and then we meet outside. So thank you very much. Thank you.